Okay. Is Kathy going to stay on? Yes, Kathy will Kathy yes. Will be here. Yeah. I'm okay. still here. I'm just not running my video because it uses up more data on my plan. Certainly too. All right. So we've got folks joining us now. Um, got about 30 people in the webinar so far. And um, we'll be getting started in just a few minutes. We want to give everybody a chance to log in and get settled. Um, and what you will notice is that the chat function has been disabled for this webinar, but you do have the ability to utilize the Q&A. So if you do have a question throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A um, that you see in your little control screen. All right, we'll give it a couple minutes to let everybody get settled in the webinar before we get started. Welcome for those folks that have just joined us. We will be getting started in about two minutes. Um, <clears throat> this is the Herbs in Your Daily Life presentation. Uh, this is the third in a series of presentations. And um, we have disabled the chat function, so please use the Q&A if you have questions throughout the presentation. We are recording this presentation, and if you registered um, through Zoom, you will have access to the link of the recording following the presentation. Welcome folks. Um, <clears throat> we'll get started here uh, in just a second. I just want to thank you for joining us today. Um, we've got about half of the registered number uh, that have joined us in the webinar so far, so I anticipate some more folks to kind of stroll in here over the next couple minutes. Um, I do want to just point out a few things. Your um, uh, camera and microphone uh, has been turned off for this webinar because we have so many people registered. Um, the chat function is also disabled, so please utilize the Q&A if you have a question. Um, and you just type it in the Q&A and we will either um, have somebody answer you throughout the course of the presentation or we'll, we'll answer the question at the end. The presentation is being recorded, and as someone who registered, you will have access to that recording link once the presentation has concluded. And with that, um, I will go ahead and introduce myself and then our speaker, and uh, we'll get started. 
So uh, I just want to thank you all for joining us today. My name is Alyssa Vinson and I am the residential horticulture agent for the Manatee County Extension Office in Manatee County, Florida. Um, if you're not familiar with Extension, we are a function of the land grant university system where we, uh, we take the researched information that is um, kind of gathered at the University of Florida as well as other educational institutions and we distill that information, make it relevant and applicable to the lives of the people in our communities and then share that information with the end goal being to enhance the quality of human life for the people in our communities. So um, as I said, we, we do um, work through the University of Florida. We are a function of that university. The other land grant university here in the state of Florida is FAMU. Um, so we work very closely with them as well. There is an extension office in every county in Florida. Not um, every office has as many folks in it as ours does. Um, we're one of the larger um, county extension offices. And we do offer programs and educational opportunities in a variety of different topics. So um, where my program focuses on residential horticulture, we look at landscape decisions um, in individual residences and in communities and the ways in which our decisions in our landscapes kind of impact the broader environment. Um, we have the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program within my program area, as well as the Master Gardener Volunteer Program. Our Master Gardener Volunteers provide a um, absolutely uh, insurmountable service to the uh, to the community. They donate over 10,000 hours of time every year and without them we wouldn't be able to accomplish our mission. Um, they help us get into all different areas of the community and um, really are the, the feet on the ground when it comes to providing that education that enhances the quality of life for people in Manatee County. So um, <clears throat> we have about 109 Master Gardener volunteers currently and this webinar series is um, part of that Master Gardener program. Today you'll be hearing from a guest speaker um, and I'll let, um, I'll give her a little bit more introduction in just a second. I just wanted to highlight some of the ways that our program impacts Manatee County and these are just a few kind of metrics that we use to highlight the ways that, that we um, as extension get out into the community and really help enhance our community. You can see over $2 million in value in CEU licenses, um, over $860,000 in the volunteer time donated. And again, that's over 10,000 hours from the Master Gardener Volunteer Program alone. We also have 4-H volunteers and, um, and other kind of county volunteers that help with certain projects at certain times of the year. We have over 28,000 youth that are educated through the 4-H program, as well as other youth development programs, and then over 14 million gallons of water um, saved to Manatee County Utilities customers. So those are just a few of the ways that we impact the community. We have folks that are working on things as various as marine fisheries, commercial fishing, commercial livestock, nursery production. Um, we have folks that work specifically on kind of how to be a better um, partner in a relationship. We have relationship building classes. We have folks that do our food and nutrition program who reach out into Title I schools and teach kids how to make healthy eating choices. So we really do span a wide variety of topics. And I'm hopeful that if you are new to Extension, if you've never joined us before for a presentation, that you'll look for more of our offerings. Um, and be sure to check out our YouTube and our Facebook page for other videos and webinars that we have had in the past. And with that, I am going to stop my share. And I am going to let Dr. Angela Fritz share her screen. She is our guest presenter today, and she is coming from all the way across the pond. Um, and it is four o'clock in the afternoon, her time. So we're really happy to, to have her. Um, she's going to be providing information on using herbs in your daily life, um, different ways that you can incorporate them uh, for your personal benefit. Um, she is a master herbalist and a holistic health practitioner. And I'll let her um, give a little bit more of her background as she um, introduces herself. But I thank her for her time and her expertise, and we look forward to the presentation today. Thanks. Thank you, Alyssa. I'm really happy to be here. And as Alyssa mentioned, it's four o'clock in the afternoon, but good morning to you all. 
Uh, we will, so you have heard about uh, how to grow herbs in the last two sessions, two weeks, and now we will be talking about what you do with herbs in your daily life. Just, oops, I'm not sure. Yes. Okay, my name is Angela Fritz and I'm a master herbalist and holistic health practitioner and I'm an academic member of the American Botanical Council. And with that means that I'm, what I'm talking about is scientifically validated because the American Botanical Council has a lot of a huge database. And the other thing is the US National Institute of Health. And I will refer to the FDA grass list, that's a list that has herbs on it that are recognized as safe and the American Herbal Product Association. Um, I myself have been in herbs more almost all my life because my grandmother introduced me to herbs. But as I told you, it's not only what my grandmother told me. Uh, I went to college and so, and I'm using all these uh, references. So everything I'm telling you about is science-based. But anyhow, I have to tell you all information given today is for educational purposes only. And it's not intended to replace advice by a healthcare provider. That's very important because I don't know about your metabolism. I don't know whether you're taking any medication or something like that. And when I'm talking about herbs and the efficacy of herbs, you just have to have this in mind that it's your own responsibility how to use the herbs. What you can expect today, I will introduce you to the benefits of herbs. And then we will talk about herbs in your diet. There will be recipes and tips and uh, Kathy Oliver will send the recipes out later on. And then we will go a little bit into herbs and beauty and I will tell you how to make a facial cream. And in the end, I will talk about herbs for your personal wellness. Everything I'm telling you about today, we will focus on herbs you may grow yourself. As John told you last week, there's no better thing than to grow your herbs by yourself because whatever you are going to buy in the supermarket or even in a health food store has a long shelf life. Yes, even a health food store, people do not really buy herbs there. And so it's just too long that they will be there on the shelf. So grow your own herbs and then you will really have the plentiful of nature. Okay, Kathy, maybe we can do the first poll questions now. Kathy? Okay. Do you see the poll questions? Okay, so maybe you just tell me a little bit more. Do you use herbs in your diet? And have you used herbs other than in cooking? Just let's have a quick look. And which herbs are you familiar with to use? We're getting some good responses. Okay. Okay, maybe we should stop it now, Kathy. Okay, I'm going to give it about uh, 10 seconds and then in the poll. <laughs> okay. Okay. We've got 75 out of 97 answers. That's great. And here's the results. Okay. So. Most of you do use herbs and salads and uh, depending on the recipe. 
And many of you have used already herbs for minor ailments. That's great. And you know about turmeric. That's great as well. Okay, so let's go on now. I will tell you about the benefits of herbs. Herbs have active constituents that assist the body's proper functioning. And the efficacy of plants have been known for ages all around the world. Uh, we know about more than 5,000 years ago that the first uh, things were written down about plants and how to use plants. With the chemical knowledge today, it is possible to validate the medicinal effect. So today, now we know which constituents really help in these herbs and which are really effective. Active constituents, here are just a few of them. Uh, vitamins, minerals, volatile oils, bitters, that's everything that tastes bitter. And I think you know all these. But the last two, maybe not, phenols and flavonoids. And so I will introduce you to these two a little bit more closely. Phenols, that's a varied group of plant constituents, often anti-inflammatory, antiseptic. And the plants produce phenols to protect itself against infection and insects. Examples are rosemary, thyme, mint, sweet potato. So sweet potato is something you would not have to buy organic because if it's grown properly, the skin of the sweet potato has so many phenols in it that the sweet potato protects itself uh, against insects and infection. So there's no need for chemicals. But you should eat this skin because that's good for you because when you're eating it, it's good for your body as well. And last week, John mentioned already willow, that he is using willow water for his garden to protect his plants and uh, that they can grow more. It's like a growth hormone, like something like that. I will go into that a little bit later and introduce you to willow a little bit more closely. The next thing is flavonoids. Flavonoids act as pigments, pigments imparting color to flowers and fruits. They are antioxidant and especially useful in maintaining a healthy circulation. Some have anti-inflammatory, antiviral, and even liver protective activity. But you should know that flavonoids need oil or fat to be dissolved and extracted. Examples are carrots, the spice paprika, red, green, yellow bell pepper, anato, and turmeric. Uh, carrots, if you like to munch on baby carrots or something like that, that's good for you because you have the fiber. But to have the whole nutrition that's in a carrot, you would have to eat something like peanuts or cheese or something like together with it. You can see for yourself that flavonoids dissolve in oil. Uh, for example, I like to cook. Um, kitchen soup, um, chicken soup, I'm sorry, chicken soup with turmeric. And I cook, usually I cook it the day before we want to eat it and put it in the fridge so that the fat is on top. And in the next morning, the fat is yellow. So all the turmeric is in this fat. So I have to add turmeric again. Um, I will talk about turmeric a little bit more later because it's such a wonderful thing that you really should use it. So just be aware with everything that has color, just use a little bit of fat or oil so that it can resolve and extract it. Uh, these active components are more concentrated in dried herbs than in fresh ones because fresh herbs have water in it as well. So you need at least double the amount of fresh herbs. So if you go into your backyard and just pick some fresh peppermint leaves to make a peppermint tea, you would need really a lot to make the same tea like when you have dried herbs and just brew the tea out of it. So just keep that in mind. Okay, so let's go to herbs in your daily diet. My advice is use a variety of herbs. Choose your own blend. Use lots of herbs, and therefore you can reduce salt. 
and follow your taste buds, not only recipes. Just eat whatever you like and use a blender. I don't like to chop up herbs because, uh, um, well, it's time consuming. So I use a blender and you should use a grinder for seeds and tough dried herbs. I will talk about that a little bit later as well. And here you can see when I'm going in my backyard and harvest my herbs, what it looks like. So it's not just a few twigs, a few leaves. I try to get all whatever I can and I put it in a blender. So I recommend that as well. Delicate fresh herbs should be used fresh in salad sauces or added to a cooked dish shortly before serving. Um, in the French cuisine, you have the term fine herbs, and usually it's related to parsley, chives, tarragon, and chervil. Um, I, in my backyard, have parsley, tarragon, basil, lemon balm, and peppermint, and these are herbs I will introduce you to a little bit more closely. And as Becky told you already, I think with these fine, delicate herbs, you should eat the stems as well. Uh, not only the leaves, so because there is so much in these stems as well, nutritional wise, so just do that. Now, let's have a closer look at parsley. I love the story John gave us last week when he was telling us that in his the family of his mother, the daughter, when she was married, always got a parsley plant to take with her. And I think that's for a reason because fresh parsley leaves are highly nutritious and may be considered a natural vitamin and mineral supplement. So don't just use parsley as a garnish on your plate because it looks nice and green. Just eat a lot of it. And then there are the seeds of parsley. Yes, just let it go to seeds because these seeds have a strong diuretic action like celery seeds also. And uh, they are used in the treatment of gout, rheumatism, arthritis, by encouraging the flushing out of waste products from inflamed joints. So parsley seeds are good when you try to detoxicate your body, to detoxify it. Uh, parsley was traditionally also used as a promoter for menstruation. Um, so it may be, so you should be careful when pregnant to eat too much parsley. The next thing is tarragon. Uh, tarragon is one of the four herbs in fine herbs in the French uh, cooking, and it's the main flavor in sauce bernays. Um, tarragon stimulates the digestion, and it may have a mild sedative action and traditionally it has been taken if periods are delayed. So this also you should not take during pregnancy, but that's just my advice. So if I'm take, talking about taking, it's a huge amount. So not just a few uh, of the leaves you may take as well, uh, you may eat as well. Basil, I think basil is one of all of our favorites. Uh, traditionally, uh, it was used as an insect repellent and to relieve insect bites. You may try this. I tried it. It does not help me, but maybe it helps you. And research today suggests that basil acts on the digestive system and the nervous system. So it may be used to prevent or relieve nausea and vomiting. It's mildly sedative and may be used for, for anxiety and insomnia. So that's one of the herbs. And if you are using it for anxiety and insomnia, you should not just eat it. It's the best thing to just brew a tea out of it. Now, all these herbs are very good in green sauces. And you can make green sauces with any kind and amount of herbs. And there are different bases uh, like uh, red wine vinegar and olive oil, lemon juice and olive oil, and maybe mustard, Greek yogurt uh, and mustard. And then there are add-ons, onions, garlic, nuts, cayenne pepper. So just be creative, you know? 
I did collect some recipes for green sauces and uh, Kathy will send all the recipes to you. So we do not have to go into detail here, but okay, you can use these recipes, but be creative and just make your own sauces. That's much more fun. And then you should uh, add fresh herbs to cook dishes like green rice or green pasta. So you cook rice or pasta, chop your choice of herbs in a blender or food processor together with garlic, onions, add olive oil and salt to taste. And then you combine it with the cooked rice and cooked pasta. And when I do it, it looks like that. So my rice is cooked with a little bit of turmeric and then I added all the herbs and I tell you, it really tastes great and you should try it. Okay, more recipes with fresh herbs. Well, you should add it to every salad and you can add it to any dish you are cooking. Mashed potatoes, soups, stews, pasta, whatever. Just have a few fresh herbs at hand and add it to your cooked dishes. And then there are herbs, especially dried ones, you would like to cook together with other ingredients like thyme, marjoram, oregano, sage, rosemary. There are some people that put these dried herbs or some seeds into um, a tea ball or something like that and cook it with. I like to have it in my dish and therefore I grind the dried herbs and the uh, seeds as well. And I will, um, tell you a little bit later how to do that. But it's, it's really good if you do that because then you have all the nutrition that's in these herbs and in the seeds. But the dried ones you will have to cook. Okay, one of these herbs is rosemary. Rosemary has traditionally used to help with circulation problems, indigestion and rheumatism. And there's research that suggests that rosemary is supportive for rheumatism, stimulates circulation of the blood to the head, and therefore improving memory and concentration. So just go into your backyard where the rosemary is, pick a twig of rosemary and put it in your water. Then you have a designer water and it should improve your memory and concentration. So just try that. Now, let me tell you something about seeds. Within every seed, there are nutrients for the seedling that will grow out of it. And all the seeds are rich in oil, vitamins, minerals, and proteins. So if you have the problem here in Florida that the herbs start to bloom very soon and go to, to seeds, just let it be and eat the seeds. Cilantro is one of the herbs that was mentioned already by Becky and John, because everyone loves, or almost everyone, some don't love cilantro. And the seeds of cilantro are called coriander. They taste differently. And as Becky mentioned already, they are chewed to sweeten uh, the breath, especially after eating garlic in the Middle East when you go to a restaurant like you have peppermint here in Florida uh, at the cashier, they have a little bowl with uh, coriander seeds so that you can sweeten your breath. There is research that coriander may reduce the uptake of heavy metal when eating fish. So when you have, uh, cook a fish and you use some coriander with it, maybe it helps with uh, the heavy metal. And they are encouraging results in assisting the management of diabetes. So especially pre-diabetes, when, when you are not um, diabetic already, then there's a lot of things you can eat. I think most of you will know that. And coriander is one of these. So whenever you have a cilantro plant and you are just turn around and it will bloom and go to seeds, 
be happy about that because the coriander seeds are a good source of vitamins C and a lot of minerals. Then there are two other seeds I would like to introduce you to that's caraway and cumin. And the interesting thing is caraway, the origin is in Europe, and cumin, the origin is in North Africa. And both of these look a little bit alike, they taste different, but both have the same medic medicinal efficacy. So both are traditionally used for illnesses of the digestive system, like reducing gases and abdominal distension. Uh, for example, uh, for even for babies, there is a uh, tea cooked out of a few seeds helps with uh, uh, reducing gases and uh, with uh, stomach ache. So, and research suggests that it stimulates the entire digestive process. And what's best is it's good to detoxify your body. So it's good to include your, these seeds in your diet. And both of these seeds are a good source of protein, vitamin C, and all kinds of minerals. Then there's mustard seed. When you have seen mustard seeds, it's a very tiny seed. And in the Christian New Testament, the mustard seed is used by Jesus in the parable of the mustard seed as a model for the kingdom of God, which initially starts small, but grows into the biggest of all garden plants. That's because in this little seed, there is so much nutritional value, especially B vitamins and minerals. So you add it to spicy dishes and soups, Traditionally, it's used for digestive, laxative, antiseptic, and circulative stimulant properties. So just use these seeds. When I was talking about using seeds, grinding seeds, this one is the best to grind in a coffee grinder uh, because it's so very small. So when you have seeds, the best thing is create your own blend. Mix seeds like pepper, coriander, cumin, caraway, mustard seeds, and put the mixture in a pepper grinder. So when you put it in a pepper grinder, you would just grind pepper, but put other seeds with it, and it's really tasty. And then in South France, they um, have little grinder for dried herbs as well. So Create your own blend, thyme, rosemary, sage of dried herbs and put it in a pepper or salt grinder and then you can use it um, in every dish you want to. Now, preserving fresh herbs. John has talked about already about how to freeze or dry herbs and he's told you that you may use salt to preserve your herbs. And I tell you, make your own herbal salt. Be creative. Design your own blend. Decide yourself for the best herb salt ratio, because when you use more salt, it's better preserved and good for months. Be careful with the seasoning with herb salt. It's still salt. And I'm using Mediterranean sea salt. It has more minerals and adds to the flavor. So here are two recipes, and I think Cassie will send these out as well. So the left one is with less salt. So you would use three loosely packed cups of fresh herbs, whichever you like, with half a cup of salt. And when you are using more salt, you would use just a quarter of a cup of fresh herbs and uh, one cup of salt. It's a little bit different in the process. So when you get this recipe, just follow it. Uh, so that you really can store it in your fridge and uh, have it for a long time. You can also add salt to ground dried herbs and seeds. Um, I would suggest that you grind seeds and tough herbs first using a coffee grinder 
and then put together with a salt in a blender and pulse until mixed. Uh, you can combine any ground seeds and herbs with sea salt. So, as I tell you, on and on, be creative. Just don't follow recipes, not only recipes. Okay, that was the herbs that you would eat in your daily diet. And now I want to introduce you a little bit what you can do with herbs for your beauty. How to make creams and oils. The first thing is you have to choose a carrier or a combination. Here's a list. Baby oil, petroleum jelly. These two are mineral oils and they are byproducts of petroleum refinement. And so I do not really recommend it. Baby oil um, sounds safe, but I don't like it. But you can use cold pressed vegetable oil, any you buy in the supermarket. That's not an issue. You can buy, uh, use coconut oil, jojoba oil, lanolin. Lanolin is uh, the byproduct of wool uh, production. Uh, it's good for your skin. It's absorbed very easily because it's from sheep and not a plant. And then there's shea butter and aloe vera. And I will introduce you a little bit more to these two. Uh, just a hand, if you are using aloe vera, you will need a blender to mix it with oils and butter if you want to use it not only by itself, because that's not an oil. Shea butter is a fat extracted from the nuts of the shea tree in Africa. It is used in cosmetics to moisturize the skin. Shea butter melts at body temperature and is easily absorbed. So if you have shea butter, just put it more firm and you just put it on your skin and wait a little bit because with the body temperature, it will be soft and then you can really spread it on your skin. And it's easily absorbed. You will not have a greasy feeling. It is said to have anti-inflammatory and sunblocking properties. Um, please do not use it instead of uh, any sunblocking uh, you will use, especially in the Florida sun. But in your, if you use it on a daily basis, it, it may just help your skin because shea butter softens and nourishes your skin. Uh, in the picture here, there's refined shea butter. The raw one will be a little bit more yellowish. And I like the refined better because I'm not sure what in the raw still is in it. But when I make my own facial creams, I always use shea butter as a basis. And then there's aloha. Aloha is a plant native to Africa as well, and it's cultivated today and grows wild in tropical countries and in some parts of the Mediterranean. And it grows very well in Florida. The juice of the leaves is used for cosmetic and medicinal purposes. So you just break one of these uh, thick branches or twigs or whatever you call it. And then you have this clear juice and you put it on your skin. And it has been used for a long time as an ointment for minor burns and sunburn. So you can try this. Um, you may use lower uh, to make your own facial lotion with, uh, with herbs as well. But as I told you already, if you want to combine it, for example, with shea butter, you will have just, or with vegetable oil, you have, will have to have a blender to do that. Now, the second step is you choose dried herbs. Herbs for your skin are, for example, calendula, also called marigold. Uh, it's cleansing, healing. I will introduce you a little bit more about that uh, a little bit later. Uh, chamomile, mint, rosemary, thyme, dandelion, lavender. So these are usually the herbs you would use to make your own lotion. Calendula is a flower 
were historically used topically to treat burns, bruises, cuts, and rashes. And uh, it has been shown to stimulate granulation, so it's forming no new tissue at the side of a healing wound. So you can say calendar renews your skin. So that's something why I really like to use calendula. And then there's chamomile. Chamomile is one of the best herbs. We heard already that it's not easy to grow it in Florida, but you really should have chamomile at home. Uh, traditionally, it has been used for all kinds of inflammation. I grew up in a rural area and my father, he had been a rural doctor. And as a kid, we were sent out in the fields to gather these flower heads and then they were dried at home and he would give these to his patients to brew a tea out of it for inflammation and or as a gargle or something like that. So research suggests that it has anti-inflammatory and relaxant action. It's valuable for pain, indigestion, acidity, gas, bloating, colic, and even useful for hay fever and asthma. Uh, for, okay, I will tell that. Now go on with, we go on with making creams and oils. So you would fill a pot with water, place a heat resistant glass bowl in it and layer it with the cheesecloth, it looks like that. So we have the pot, the glass bowl, and the cheesecloth. Now in the pot goes the water, in the glass bowl, your carrier, like shea butter or something like that, and your herbs into the cheesecloth. Now you let all this simmer for on a very low heat for about 20 minutes. Start with a small amount. These creations do not last as long as store-bought ones. And the ratio? There's no right or wrong. Herbs should be well absorbed by the carrier oil or butter. And then you let it cool and strain. And with the help of the cheesecloth, you squeeze out every drop of the carrier into, glass, into the glass bowl. The herbs will stay behind in the cheesecloth Add some drops of essential oil for fragrance because, for example, when you use uh, calendula, it does not really have a fragrance. And then store it in a tight container like a screw top jar. And you have your own cream or oil with all the benefits of nature. Now there's something else, facial steam. You would bring water to a boil Place herbs, one cup fresh or quarter cup, cup dried in a bowl, pour hot water in and stir. And then you put a towel over your head and lean over the bowl and steam your face for five minutes. Herbs for steaming, great herbs for steaming are chamomile, lavender, peppermint and thyme. And especially chamomile because when you have a cytositis or something like that, even a flu, a, or something, a cold, breathing in chamomile steam will open your sinuses. So you should give that a try. And then there are bath sashes. Place herbs in a little muslin bag or in a piece of cheesecloth. And then you place it just, uh, you have to close it tight, place it in a pot. Fill the pot with water until the bag is submerged. Bring it to a boil, cover the pot and let steep for 15 to 20 minutes. And then you can pour this into your bath water. Or if you like to have a shower more than a bath, let it cool and rub your skin with a sachet. So that's good. And here are some herbs you would use for your bath. For cleansing, calendula, chamomile, rosemary, Lavender for calming, it's also marjoram leaf, that's interesting. For revitalization, you have rosemary leaf, peppermint leaf. For purifying, use ginger root, thyme, lemongrass. For fitness, juniper berry, bay leaf, sage, oregano, eucalyptus, 
And bay leaf, for example, is really good for sore muscles. So if you have done too much workout and your muscles are sore, just soak into a bath with bay leaves. Okay, so now that's the last part. It's herbs for your personal wellness. Here's a disclaimer again. All information I'm giving you is for educational purposes only and is not intended to replace the advice by a health care provider. Again, I don't know your metabolism. I don't know what medications you are taking. There may be interactions, but all the herbs I'm talking about are usually safe. So you would like to put something in your cabinet for pain and that's white willow bark. So John has already told you about white willow because he is using it for his garden. White willow bark contains salicylic acid. That's the active ingredient in aspirin. Plus it contains several other constituents that prohibit side effects. And it has been used for pain and fever for thousands of years. And today there's research. So we know that white willow relieves pain and soothes fever and without side effects of thinning the blood and irritating the stomach. Um, it's an excellent remedy for arthritis and rheumatic pain. It relieves inflammation, swelling, improves mobility in painful or cranky joints. So as you can see, it's everything that aspirin is doing. But on a natural basis. The use of willow, so when you are using willow water, you would use the twigs and branches of the willow tree and um, just let it soak in boiling water and then you can use it for your plants. For medicinal purpose, the inner willow bark is used. So you may brew a tea out of the inner bark or that's more easy just buy capsules uh, at a pharmacy because, but just make sure, read the label that these capsules only and only contain the uh, white willow bark. Okay, the next thing is you would like to boost your immunity and that's echinacea. You will like these purple flowers when you plant it in your backyard. Echinacea is native to North America and it's one of the world's most important medicinal herbs today. There has been a lot of research. The roots and leaves are used for medicinal purposes, not the flowers. And traditionally it has been used by Native American tribes for all kinds of ailments. Today research uh, suggests that there is an ability to raise the body's resistance to bacterial and viral infections by stimulating the immune system. Um, it's also helpful remedy for allergies and maybe asthma. But in this case, you just have to find out for yourself. It's safe. Um, you see, it can be safely consumed when used appropriately. Uh, according, in accordance with uh, the botanical safety handbook. Um, so just brew a tea out of it and see if it works for you. And then there's something you would like for cough and cold. It's thyme, sage and chamomile I recommend. Thyme has traditionally been used and now it's scientifically verified as a remedy, a tea for throat and chest infections such as bronchitis. Uh, it has been used as a food pres uh, preservative in the Middle Ages because it has strongly antiseptic uh, action. Uh, research knows that uh, it suggests that time supports the body's normal function and counteracts the effect of aging. That's something as well. Um, this is something when you use uh, the fresh leaves of thyme, you would use a lot to brew a tea out of it that you really have the, 
that it's good for your throat and your chest infection. But um, you really should try this before trying anything else because sometimes these natural things help. And then there's sage. Sage has been traditionally used and verified as a tea or gargle for sore throat and canker sores and sore gums. So brew a tea out of it and gargle with it. And um, especially when you have a sore throat, uh, it's antiseptic and it has stomach supporting activity. Uh, it even may help relieve menopausal symptoms like whole, hot flashes and dizziness. So you would like to try this as well. And then maybe you want something for your stomach. Peppermint, chamomile, dandelion is my suggestion. Uh, peppermint is traditionally used to help with all kinds of digestive problems and especially used to calm an upset stomach. There was a mother, she came to me because her uh, daughter, she threw up every time they had a test at school. And uh, I told her to try peppermint tea in the morning or shortly before the test, and it really helped. So you may try peppermint tea. And in some uh, cafe um, houses here in Europe, where they drink a really strong coffee, some people add peppermint tea on the side or before or something like that. I did not notice that. But uh, so just to help with the stomach. And then there's dandelion. Becky mentioned that. And so I had to put this in here. Uh, dandelion has been traditionally used as a diuretic and detoxifying remedy. And research has confirmed that. And since the leaves contain high levels of potassium, it counteracts the side effect of losing potassium like conventional diuretics do. So if you want to do something for your stomach and to detoxify your body, a dandelion tea is a very good thing to, uh, to do. And the story behind that is my grandmother, she had a recipe. She would take the whole plant, the flowers, the root, the leaves, chop it up very finely, and put it in a jar very tight and pour vodka over it because some of the constituents of dandelion uh, need uh, alcohol to be dissolved and vodka has half 50 percent water and 50 percent alcohol and so vodka is usually used for tinctures to produce tinctures so she would put this in a jar let it sit for two weeks or so and then she would strain it and put it in a dropper and if somebody had some digestive problems she would just give out a few drops okay the next thing is put something in your cabinet for inflammation chamomile you see chamomile is really one of the best i've mentioned it already so often now and the second thing is turmeric John mentioned that turmeric grows very well here in Florida. So you really should give this a try. Turmeric is a powerful anti-inflammatory herb and has a long tradition as a remedy to help improve liver function. The yellow and green in curcuma increases bioproduction, may lower cholesterol, and may have a protective action on stomach and liver. There's encouraging research that turmeric may be a valuable preventive remedy for the risk of developing cancer. Uh, the story behind that is that in countries where they eat a lot of turmeric, uh, curry, the yellow stuff in curry is turmeric, uh, there is less colon cancer. And so there is a lot of research and they think this is because of the turmeric. So it's good for your body. Turmeric is rich in the phenyl curcumin and has shown powerful antioxidant effects in studies. Um, the main thing I would like to tell you, please do not buy capsules because in capsules, usually there is at least food color added. 
because turmeric has to be yellow. But with the light of the sun, it, the yellow fades. So fresh turmeric is yellow by itself. But if you buy it as a spice in the supermarket, you can be sure that color is added, and especially in the capsules. Um, it's one of the herbs that many people are taking because there's so much uh, research about it. And it's one of the herbs that the American Botanical Council is sending out that uh, there are so many frauds in the production. So the best thing is grow your own turmeric and cook it in every food that you don't mind that it turns yellow. If you don't use too much, it will not be bitter or something like that. Okay, and the last thing is you want to go to sleep. So you need something for sleeping and calming. I recommend lemon balm, chamomile, peppermint in combination as a tea, and lavender to sniff and breathe in. Lemon balm uh, has a calming effect on the central nerve system. And uh, that's what the research suggests. It has traditionally been used to lift up spirits and as a relaxing tonic for anxiety, mild depression, and restlessness and irritability. It's really safe and it, you can give it to kids as well and see if it helps. Lavender. I suggest just put dried lavender flowers into a little bag and put it next to your pillow and smell the fragrance of the flowers and relax to a good night's sleep and sweet dream or use just a drop of essential oil on your hanky or pillow uh, because there's research that it relieves sleeplessness and it's relaxing and it even helps with uh, small with the uh, some kind of depression and anxiety. So lavender to breathe in, just really breathe in this fragrance is helping your body. Okay, my advice, combine herbs. There's evidence that while using multiple herbs in teas or in a dish, the medicinal components, active ingredients may complement each other. The efficacy is greater even with smaller amounts. So brewing a tea means you do not have really to see how much you do and how less you use. And just combine herbs, like for example, I suggested for sleep that you combine chamomile, peppermint and lemongrass. And uh, that's a good thing. The other thing is use the whole herb and not extracts. Uh, there are additional active constituents that help your body in general and often prohibit side effects. The first example is white willow bark. We talked already about it because uh, the ingredients that is in aspirin, you know, over 100 years ago, Bayer had to extract silicic acid and uh, synthesize it in order to get it patented. And when you take the whole white willow bark, you have all the other constituents as well. And then there's stevia. When you are buying it in the supermarket, it's just an extract. Just the sweetness is extracted. But if you're growing stevia yourself, the whole leaf contains minerals and vitamins. Uh, dry your stevia leaves and put it in a tea ball and swirl around your coffee and tea and it will be uh, you can take it out and your tea and coffee will be sweet then there are cranberries ginkgo green tea where the capsules even may be harmful there's evidence that cranberry capsules um, usually used for uh, bladder infections contain other things than just cranberries. Ginkgo, for example, has 40, 40 known constituents and only two we know that are doing this, that the blood flow to your head is better, to your brain. And so the industry just 
extract these two. And the side effect is that you have dizziness, maybe you not, cannot even drive a car or something like that. So just take the whole, uh, uh, and green tea, green tea capsules are really harmful for your liver because it's concentrated. Green tea drinking is very, very healthy for your body. So just be careful with capsules. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions, I think we can answer these now, or you can send me an email and I will answer it afterwards. There are uh, several questions in the Q&A. Let me um, read some of them. Let's see, so questions about um, making tea. Is it better to use fresh or dry herbs? Uh, it doesn't matter. You just have to use more fresh herbs than dried herbs. It's just that you just double the amount with fresh herbs or even more. And then a question about um, do herbs maintain their properties if you use them in a cold process soap? Uh, I think so. Uh, there is no research or evidence about that, but um, um, well, I, th I think you should just use the herbs like they are. And then um, storing, when you make um, like bath products, beauty products, should you store them in the refrigerator or freezer to maintain the longevity? Uh, not the creams. You can just, uh, they store at room temperature. Uh, with this, uh, the salts I was talking about, when you use fresh herbs, it's better to store in the, free, in the fridge, uh, but otherwise you don't have to. Okay, and then there's some questions about some specific types of butters and things like that, but I'll let those folks email you more, uh, those specific okay. questions. Mm -hmm. um, and then one, one other question was, are there any um, herbs that you should not combine? Maybe do they contradict the use of others or um, you know, make them less effective if you combine them? Uh, that's um, not known. So, and uh, there are so many herbs that you never know, but um, it's, you, sh you can, all these herbs I was talking about, you can combine. So it's with the medicinal herbs, you know, that the really medicinal things that you have to be careful, especially uh, when you are on medication or something like that. But um, um, they, do, they do not harm each other. So usually they just, uh, uh, the efficacy is better when you combine the herbs. Okay, great. Well, I think um, with that, we'll go ahead and conclude the webinar today. If you have a, a very specific question that didn't get answered in the Q&A, please do send Angela an email or you can send me an email and I'll forward that um, inquiry along. We appreciate you taking the time today. Uh, there will be a survey that will populate on your screen when we close the webinar. And so please, um, if you could fill that out, that'll help us as we move forward with future webinars. And with that, everybody have a wonderful day.